very much. Comments, questions? Um, he will talk to us about numerical differential geometric algorithms. Thank you very much, Luis. So, uh, this is some of this is joint work. The the work uh, with Ian Lyle and Tracy Wang is about the symmetry side of the talk. And Great. The, um, Can you talk a bit louder? A little bit louder. Louder. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, the work on the symmetry side is uh, with uh, Ian Lyle and Tracy Wang from the University of Canberra. And on the polynomial, the real algebraic side is with uh, Fei Wang, Henry Bockowitz. So the symmetries part, uh, basically as humans, we have a sort of an intuitive notion of approximate symmetry. We look at objects and we can pick out parts of objects that look more symmetric. Even you can go to the supermarket and see articles about how human beings prefer partners that are more symmetric. So we've got some sort of intuitive notion about that. But on the algorithm side, if you're looking at, say, differential equations and you're looking for their symmetries, uh, there are well-developed sort of exact methods for exactly given differential equations, but there are not um, algorithms for finding approximate symmetry. So we'll talk about an algorithm for doing that. And the key... The key method to find approximate symmetries that I'll talk about is something called a geometric involute form, which comes out of uh, the geometric theory of differential equations. It goes back to Carton and Kuranishi. The second part of the talk will be about uh, using this geometric and diluted form in the context of getting information about approximate real varieties and developing work that's happening there. So there's a sort of a link between these two parts of the talk. And there's been some remarkable work by Lassier and collaborators in which they established this con remarkable connection between uh, convex optimization and real algebraic geometry uh, for zero-dimensional real radical ideals. And there's been some re other related extremely good work by Ma Wang and Z. And we're going to, in this part of the talk, uh, discuss some further improvements in those methods. So there's going to be methods based on facial reduction for that, if we get that far. So as part of the example for symmetries, uh, let's consider models. So if you look at Poisson's equation, you can think of a matter of distribution with density depending on where you are in space. So you can think of some sort of cloud and uh, the gravity exerted, the gravity potential for that cloud. And well, the simplest example that you have an intuitive notion about would be just having a planet concentrated in one place and a gravitational field exerted by the planet. And there you can see this natural spherical symmetry. And so you use sort of invariant coordinates to exploit that symmetry. And that's what people do naturally. And other equations which have naturally given parametric functions, such as Schrodinger's equations, so forth. So to find these hidden symmetries, the sort of the brute force way would be just to say, take, give me a change of coordinates substituted into the differential equation, demand that the differential equation remains unchanged after the substitution. And what you get from that, if you take general functions, is a, a kind of a nonlinear mess. So if you're doing this, you're working at the level of the group, and you get nonlinear equations for the transformations, and it's really nasty, so what you want to do instead is to linearize about the identity of the group. And that takes you from the group down to the Lie algebra. And these equations are nice and linear. And, it's a really, and this is the most uh, beautiful linearization because you can actually exponentiate back to regain the connected component of the identity for these groups. So, for example, for Poisson's equation, if you want to look for symmetries, what people do is that here are the linearized equations. They're a rather pleasant system of linear 
you know, a few dozen linear partial difference equations, and this is meant to be a lot easier than the original one, okay? But in fact, practice it is, because it's linear, it's overdetermined, and we've got a lot of linear methods that can be applied to those. So, the exact methods, which have been developed for some time, take these linear systems and basically apply a Grodner-like operation to them, and uh, you, you simplify them. So, let's... And actually, and when you do that, uh, let me think of an example. If you take this example and take a matter distribution with this uh, density function. What you find is that you only get a one-dimensional group. And so that's something you can prove by using the exact symbolic methods. And so these symbolic methods, and, and you've all simplified these systems of uh, overdetermined partial differential equations. So if you've used Maple's desolve, then you've actually used these because in the middle of Maple's desolve, it will call algorithms which simplify, automatically simplify these overdetermined systems. You can put the info level up on the particular program. So, but if you make this moderately complicated for it to be effective, this should be in some computable extension of, of the rational. So, but if you have even some moderately complicated function, there may be problems. And these, pro these, these algorithms are basically apply some sort of Gauss elimination. They use ordering in a, in a strong way on those systems, and that means they become unstable when applied to approximate data. So what we use instead is to take these ideas from the geometric theory of differential equation, where we use prolongations. And when you prolong them, essentially you've got some matrix that depend on the variables of the problem time your unknown function. So these are linear partial differential equations. You get a sequence of prolongations, and then we apply numerical linear algebra. So that's a key that if you're using, there's a long history of people trying to apply Grodner basis methods by literally translating Grodner basis to the approximate case. It, it led to lots of very unstable methods. So instead we go back to some very geometric ideas and when you do that, and here we substitute in a point, and the point should be in the region that you're interested in for finding approximate symmetries. And so the main thing to remember out of this is that we applied you know, some good numerical methods, like singular value decomposition on these matrices, and extract from those uh, from the singular value decomposition, the geometric features that we need to determine our completion criteria, the geometrical criteria, which are roughly like criteria for the Hilbert function of, to stabilize. Now, I'm going to just skip through this. Uh, we had developed this to determine the size of the approximate symmetry groups but we hadn't got the structure, so there was some key idea that came from Ian Lyle where you look at the commutator, so at this level of this algebra, this thing is determined by structure constants of the algebra, which locally determines a group here. And so, essentially, what we do in this approach to get the local structure is look at that commutator and apply certain geometric operations. Let's just leave it at that. Um, so for this particular matter distribution, if you apply this method, you actually get out approximate structure, which for convenience we've just rounded to some nearby symbolic objects. This is not 
This is not my goal is to actually infer the exact structure because normally you'll be dealing with approximate data. And so here, instead of getting the one-dimensional group that you find when you apply the symbolic algorithms, we actually found a three-dimensional symmetry group. So it's wrong. It's actually incorrect. But it's incorrect, but it's more interesting. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me tell you what, what's going on with this example. This example, you can see that the matter distribution, the density is symmetric in rotation in X and Y, but I've introduced an asymmetry in the Z. So basically it looks like you've got two little planets which are close together. It's sort of got a cloud density with its centers there, some sort of Gaussian center. And so if you're very far away, intuitively, it looks like a point mass. And intuitively, you would expect an approximate symmetry which has three rotations and all of the other uh, isometries you expect for these kind of problems. If you're very close, you expect that you still get the XY rotation, but you don't get the XZ or the ZY rotations. So actually, it's more interesting. Here, we've actually, and so let's, let's show a picture of this. So this is a region we've done a lot of computations. The purple here is where you very close to this matter distribution, which has got two different centers of concentration. And there, it's the approximate method only sees a one parameter rotation group. And when you get further away, and depending on the tolerance that you're using in the SPD, you'll then in the yellow region see a three parameter symmetry, which is because it's seeing that as being very close to a a sort of a mass that's a point mass far away. And when you're further away still, out here you get the maximal group for Poisson's equation. This is around about 11 dimensional symmetry group. So this gives you a region dependent way of computing symmetries and it opens the door to uh, introducing local approximate invariants in these different regions. In here we've got some sort of transition zone. And so what we need to do is develop reliable numerical criteria for saying, hey, look, this is, this is unreliable. So for example, you could look at Jacobi's identities for the algebras and so on. So we can sort of see the different colors here mean different dimensions detected in the SVD. So that's this method. And that's all going right. So, Let's go to the second part of the talk. Um, so the numerical real algebraic geometry, there's been a lot of, uh, and compared to complex algebraic geometry, there's been a lot of methods for complex algebraic geometry. But real algebraic geometry has been a much tougher subject. And there have been recent improvements in the symbolic case. Um, Mark Marina Mazza has got a sort of a, a, uh, an accelerated cylindrical algebraic composition aided with triangular decomposition algorithm. But here, there's been these really encouraging results by Lassier, Laurent, and others where they have this remarkable bridge between uh, real algebraic geometry and uh, optimization. And they incorporated a pro pro projection prolongation algorithm, essentially this uh, geometric involutive form, inside one of their papers to improve the efficiency of their method. They could do earlier t uh, termination. And so essentially, uh, they need to extend a so-called moment matrix. And so there's this kind of connection in particular with uh, work by, by Z and already at first in a thesis of Ma. So let's just look, look at, get moving here. Um, so 
real algebraic geometry, you have your basic objects, your ideals, and the radical, the real radical of an ideal is essentially the ideal that vanishes on the solution. So we're interested in the case over R because over R is what you're mostly interested in applications. And that's a really hard problem. So over C, there's, like, there's some very good numerical methods now based on uh, homotopy continuation for characterizing components in positive dimension. So just to give you a feeling for what the real radical looks like, in simple zero-dimensional cases, if you have multiplicities, so you have the complex root, they have multiplicities, the real radical, the, radi the complex radical will just remove the multiplicities. And if you've got a polynomial with real coefficients, then uh, you'll get some complex, uh, some quadratic factors, irreducible factors and also some real factors, linear factors with multiplicities, the real radical will remove those multiplicities. And also remove the irreducible complex part. So here's an example in several variables. So intuitively, the real radical is a really cool thing. Because first of all, uh, if you have, if you're working in applications and differential geometry or other applications, if you have multiplicities, it causes pain numerically. And as well, there's the additional complexity of finding these excess complex roots that you may not be interested in. So in some sense, all of the methods that work for real algebraic geometry now go through the complex roots. And so there's some, at least some glimmer of a hope that people could have methods that could avoid going through the complex roots because there could conceivably be many of those. So Macaulay matrices, this goes back to early last century, is basically to view polynomials as linear functions of their monomials. And so you have a coefficient matrix times the monomial. So it's essentially that's the same thing that we're using uh, when we're looking at linear partial differential equations. So one of the reasons that, so what we're doing is essentially you've got polynomial in some partial derivatives. This maps over to a polynomial in this. So we can, so the simplest case of constant coefficient polynomials, the rings are identical, and so a lot of methods were first developed in the partial differential equation setting, and that's, that's why it's interesting to take these results from Kartan Kuranishi over to the polynomial case. So we've got, so prolongation in the, the polynomial picture simply means multiplying by monomials up to, saturating up to a given degree, and projection means looking at the space as a linear space in the monomials, although Rob will prefer Chevy Chef polynomial, monomial bases. Uh, and uh, projection means projecting this. So we avoid the, the thing about Broca bases where you take a particular pol polynomial, you take its highest term, and you try to invert that because that means that many times in numerical computations, you have a very small leading coefficient. And so you need a more generic geometric thing where we take the uh, essentially the coefficient matrix of all of the highest terms and look at its numerical properties. And that's just the technical stuff about involutivity. This is basically just says this is a very simple method, which is Uh, another class of methods that's being developed in numerical real algebraic geometry, uh, this is joint work with Wen Yu and Wu, he initiated this method, is that to take the witness point concept that's used in numerical algebraic geometry over C, so there people slice with random affine spaces to slice through and get witness points on components, but the trouble is that method over C doesn't work well in the real case because 
just even take this circle here. If we've got, uh, this is a single polynomial. Here are the, some components. If I slice randomly with the line, I'm probably going to miss the circle. And so that's because of the properties of C. So instead, we look at, we pick a, again a random linear space and we look at the extremizing the, the orthogonal distance to the variety. So to do that, we reformulate it as a Lagrange problem and get a square system which the, can then be fed to the complex solvers. And this, in a, and there's a couple of different variations of this. Uh, John Hallenstein has developed a method which is based on a different extremal principle. And I think in the early work <coughs> by Rudy A. Roy, Safi Aldine, they used a symbolic version of this as a, a symbolic idea. So for this method, what you want it for it to be complete, you need to pick up points on every component. Here there are singular points, and we have we, we blow up the this variety slightly by perturbing it and then move away from those singular points. But unfortunately this method doesn't always work. It's not a complete method. We require different criteria, so we require uh, complete intersection criteria and real radicality of the intermediate ideals. And here, where we've got a sum of squares, this doesn't satisfy A1, so you, you don't, you're not guaranteed to get all points. So there's, so moment matrix and SDT. So we look at a semi-definite matrix so we index by alphas. We think of a monomial, x is really x1 to the alpha 1, x2 to the alpha 2, and so forth, or with this correspondence. So a simple example, if I had a fourth degree polynomial, I could take its monomial vector. This would be associated with this. When you multiply it out, this would be x squared. We associate it with these formal variables. And that's the polynomial moment matrix in this case. So, given a multivariate system, you can characterize the system by its coefficient matrix times the moment matrix being the zero matrix. And so, in order to take something like x to the fourth minus 2, this would be characterized in terms of constraints by taking the moment matrix and this corresponds to the <coughs> prolongations of that polynomial and we get this reformulation due to Lassier and others. So in our first version, well this, this is the zero dimensional case where you just have finitely many solutions. Uh, the first tries that people do is to use uh, standard interior point methods such as Yelmet and others and to look for a point with that semi-definite matrix with backspin rank. And so here, this is just an illustrated example, you can find such a point. Uh, the changes that we have made recently working with Henry is that, so if you think about it this way, uh, our polynomial system is just some sort of linear space. It's a linear constraints. And our set of convex matrices, convex semi-definite matrices is some sort of cone. And so you might hope that this sort of goes through the middle of the cone and you get generic points on the interior of the cone, but in fact for these problems you don't. You actually, you, you, you arrive your linear space that corresponds to the polynomial system is tangent to this cone, so you arrive on a face of the cone and that means it's still posed. That means that small perturbations in the data take you off this face and so what we do 
So with facial reductionist method that was introduced by Henry and John in the early 80s, of last century, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, and um, what it does is it, it projects you down onto the space, and uh, in, in that sense, then you can get an interior point on the face. And so we were we were excited to try that on some of the polynomial problems. So here is the method we're using a geometric interlude <coughs> form. You get an ascending uh, sequence of ideals. And here we're trying them out on some polynomials with normally distributed random coefficients because there's lots of nice results known about those and how many, what proportion of real roots they have. And here is the, the facial reduction method is in red. This is the interior point method illustrating the gain in efficiency here over a large class of problems. We, we did a lot of problems and we also did a bunch of multivariate problems. So that is basically the end. Uh, we, so facial reduction, we don't get a characterization of the real radical. As far as I know, uh, we, we, it's, all we can do is make a conjecture. So there's several conjectures now, and uh, Li Hong Ji and her co-workers uh, have a conjecture, was the first to make such a conjecture in the positive dimensional case, which people are really interested in about. We know that there is a finite order at which this process it becomes real radical, but nobody knows a constructive check for that order. And so there's, there's lots of motivation for this interaction between uh, real algebraic geometry and optimization, because this is a vast area and bringing those techniques over is an extremely interesting thing. So, and, and for us also, developing witness point representation, so for, to, to guarantee getting a point on each component. There's a key goal here, so there's lots of rooms for conjectures and experimentation. Thank you very much.